Hey, hello, everybody. Welcome to NCC Online. My name is Pastor Rob. Thank you for being with us again today. I uh, hope that you continue to stay with us as we continue in this brand new series called Win the Day. Today, we are on part two of that. If you missed part one, nice thing about this is you can go back on demand and, and check out that service and, and, and see what you missed. Our goal in this series is to bring seven very practical, very everyday steps to increase your faith, to help you live it out, to advance the kingdom of God. The goal is to bring seven steps or principles that you can live out in your daily faith to advance the kingdom of God. And, and I hope that you want to do that. And, and it's true that our salvation is all by grace and it's all God's free gift. But it's also true that we work out our lives and we get to participate with action and not passivity that we strive as we saw last week to become more and more like christ it's almost like paul said winning the prize that god has for us and so we get to participate in, and to get better and that's what this is about today's habit is kiss the wave that's right i said kiss the wave that sounds a little odd it comes from a very old sermon by a very well-known preacher named charles spurgeon and that phrase was coined by Spurgeon in the mid-19th century. Spurgeon, of course, was a Baptist preacher. He was from England. He was in the 19th century. He was known as the Prince of Preachers because he really set the standard for, at the time, what was considered modern-day preaching and very effective Christ-centered preaching. Even, even this day, people will, will look back to his example as he had one of the biggest churches, and he was clearly the most popular preacher of his day, uh, and, and really a, a name that people know today. And this is what he said in one of his sermons. He said, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. What does that mean? Well, I've, I've learned to embrace, and just using the word kiss, the wave, which is my trials and my struggles and, and my life that's sometimes hard. And, and that rather than just running away from the wave, or trying to escape the trials of life, I, I, in a sense, I embrace it because it's that very wave that throws me against the rock of ages. Of course, the rock of ages is an expression that is used for God, that he is our rock, he is from eternal past, he is always there for us, we can always trust on him. And so it's not saying that we love trials, it's not saying that we like hardship, it's saying that we know it's going to come so we embrace it in a sense kiss it and it's that very wave that brings us into the arms of christ what a powerful truth and that's what we want to talk about today this powerful truth now even though spurgeon was uh, a wildly popular preacher and had this really influential church ministry and he was known as the prince of preachers and he had a really good life he also had a very difficult life just some examples of that and there are probably many more. But firstly, the quote, which was quoted from Mark Batterson's book, Win the Day, is from a sermon he gave at the beginning of a massive cholera epidemic in England. And that happened in 1854. In fact, there was another one shortly after. And this, <coughs> this epidemic took many lives. And so he was talking about that in this sermon. And that's reportedly where this quote comes from. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I think how appropriate that we would be quoting and talking about it coming out out of a pandemic and still in a pandemic where people have died. So the same principles apply as they did way back then. Also, Spurgeon had bouts of anxiety and depression. In fact, today he would have been uh, no doubt called clinically depressed and, and clinically anxious. He had an anxiety disorder, and it afflicted his whole life. You see it in his writings, his journaling. It came out in his sermons, and it was something that he had to live with and learn how to cope with, and it was very, very difficult, and many of you can understand that, and maybe you have some of that yourself, and you can see how that can make a tremendously difficult life, and so that was part of what he was calling the wave. That's just the difficulties in our emotions. Also, at age 33, he got gout in his leg which is a pretty big problem back in the mid-1800s that you couldn't just deal with. And it was so bad that it caused his leg pain 
all the time. In fact, it's said that when he preached, and he would preach some 13 times a week, he had to stand on one leg. He couldn't use the other leg because of the gout and the pain that he was in, and he never let that show. His wife, Susanna, was homebound for much of their marriage, many, many years. She had some kind of illness. It kept her very sick. She couldn't leave the house. She couldn't go to church. She couldn't see his magnificent preaching, for example. And that had to have caused a lot of tension, but he was able to care for her through the years. And then one other time in his life, Spurgeon was in a crowded movie theater when someone literally yelled fire, something that's illegal to do today. And they yelled fire in this crowded movie theater. And as you can imagine, people just sort of stampeded out and many people died because of that event. And he was there, he witnessed it. And he wrote later that it really had a, a, a an anxiety effect on his life. Today, he probably would have been called P, have, having PTSD because he had a bit of post-traumatic stress from this event. So badly that when he would preach, and by the way, he would often preach to 10,000 people at a time. He would be in these huge crowds of people and it would trigger the anxiety that he got from that event and, he, and, and that never went away. He just had this sort of PTSD. Uh, at age 57, he died of Bright's disease, which is like a kidney disease, and of the gout that he had at, at a fairly young age. So this was a tough life. He had known what it meant to crash against the waves and the trials of life. Uh, he said later, I'm no dry land sailor. And what he meant by that is, don't think I just preach about this. Don't just hear the quote today and think, well, he didn't know what he was talking about. No, no, he, he was out in the waves. He wasn't a dry land sailor. He was out getting wet and going through the storms. Of course, he meant his life and, and, and what he was trying to do for Jesus. Perhaps you can relate. I, I'm giving this message partly today because it was in our schedule, but partly because I don't know if I've ever seen a time in the life of NCC where there are so many personal problems and needs that I personally knew about, loss and death and health issues and marriage problems, big problems, emotional problems, anxiety problems, depression, and on it goes. And I think so many are struggling and the pandemic really brought that out or in some cases made it a lot worse. And so if you feel like you can relate to any of that, this, this is definitely for you today. And I want to talk about Peter a little bit because Peter, the disciple of Jesus, concluded long before Spurgeon did, the same thing, that he had learned to kiss the wave that threw him against the rock of ages, that is Christ. And I think the day he learned it is a familiar passage. I'm going to read it. It's Mark 4, 35 to 41 from the New Living, is the story when he literally went through the waves of life. This is the time when the disciples and Jesus were crossing the Sea of Galilee and a storm came up. And this is what happened. It says, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke up woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. And then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. So here you have Jesus and his disciples, typical day, Jesus says to them, hey, we're going on this journey. We're going across this lake right here. They had been across this lake before, Sea of Galilee. And they all say, okay. They get in the boat. They start going over. And then the terrific happens. A seismic squall comes up. These waves start flooding into the boat. They're having a near-death experience. And remember, this is before the days of PFDs. They don't have any life jackets in the boat. They don't have any training. Um, they, they don't have the Coast Guard to come rescue them. There aren't going to be other boats around to come save them. They, they know this is a, probably a death sentence. And they're believing they're going to die, quite literally. And Jesus is 
their only option at this point, probably not completely understanding that he's the Lord. But they go and they get him, and he's sleeping in the back of the boat. He's got a pillow there. He's comfortable, somehow able to sleep through this devastating storm. They call him. They wake him up. They're a little irritated, and he immediately questions their faith. Where's your faith? Haven't you been with me long enough is implied here. Don't you remember what I've shown you, the miracles I've been doing? Don't you think I can get you out of this jam? Have you not learned that yet? And the answer, Christ is no, they haven't learned this yet. And then Jesus does a great miracle. He controls the waves. He controls the wind. He speaks to them and they calm down. And the disciples are starting to understand this is more than just a mere mortal. Who is this man who can control nature itself? And their lives are shaped. And why I'm picking on Peter is because years later, the disciples' lives were completely changed. They, they had really matured. They're now the leaders of the church movement. And Peter in particular was shaped this day. I'm just sure of it because he writes some in the New Testament, specifically a passage in 1 Peter that he penned himself to tell us how to live and how to believe about suffering. And I can't help but think some of his theology, of course, was shaped by what Jesus taught him, but was also shaped by this event in his life when he got to be a part of history. And when he literally was having to make a choice about what to do with these waves and how does that relate to King Jesus. And so when we look at Peter, we, we go to 1 Peter 4, and I want to read verses 12 to 13. This is what he writes much later on for us, the church today, to lean into and learn about uh, what does it mean to, to suffer. And he says, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. There's a little bit more there, but this is these are the key verses if you want to read more on your own. He says some very powerful things, and I want to lean in for the time that we have left in what Peter is teaching us, what we can take away practical, how we can kiss the wave in our lives and become better Christians for it, to have better lives for it, and to know this, this joy that he's talking about, rather than always being just sort of, sort of blown around. And the first thing he says, which is the starting point here, is don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when you face these trials which is a little bit ironic coming from Peter because Peter, he was with a group. Several of them were fishermen. They, they knew the Sea of Galilee. They, they knew that this little boat might have trouble. They knew, for example, that these squalls came up all the time. They knew that in that specific instance, that the, sort of surrounded by mountains and the, and, the, and the air pressure was different above these mountains and the air would come down into this really low area. Um, really low and it would hit the 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 temperature drop would would cause severe storms so these storms would come out of nowhere the wind would just pick up and that's exactly what happened in a way you could say you know disciples you should have been surprised about that you should have been a little bit more aware and cautious and maybe not don't you know don't don't go too far out in the middle maybe go around the edges but one of the things peter takes away is we shouldn't be surprised when the storms of life literally or figuratively come our way. A and that's really the first lesson. Don't be surprised when life gets tough. Don't be surprised when suffering comes. Don't, don't be surprised. Doesn't mean you have to like it. Doesn't mean you have to want it. But don't be surprised by it. Don't be caught off guard by it. Doesn't mean be a pessimist, by the way. We can live that way too, where uh, everything's negative. Of course, bad things are happening. Woe is me. Oh, no, 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 no. Peter's an optimist. Every Christian should be an eternal optimist because we're headed to an eternally optimistic place called heaven. But that's different from being vigilant, being watchful, being aware, being cautious, understanding the times, understanding what's going to happen if we follow Christ, that things are going to come our way, trials are going to come our way, attacks are going to come our way, life is going to happen, just normal life, the brokenness of sin in our lives, even what God doesn't desire because of that brokenness is sometimes going to happen. So we need to be aware of that. We should not be so surprised. Even in the last couple of years, 
we should not be surprised that we're having a season of life that's so difficult. That's so that's so tough. Last week I was uh, kayaking with some some buddies and uh, we were having a good time. We went to a place though that I had never been. It was it was choppier. It was more open water than I'm used to, and we started off a little cautious. I thought, well, it's calm. The wind wasn't bad. We'll probably be fine to go a little more out in open water, and we did. But when we did that, the wind started picking up. The waves were picking up. It got actually for a little kayaks. If you've ever been out in open water, you know, it can get pretty hairy and it did. And we were, we were beyond where we should have been and, and everyone was ended up fine and, and everybody came back safe. But there was a moment where we were all like, okay, shoot, we made a mistake. And, and in a way, uh, Peter's talking even about that literal example. It's like, don't be surprised when you get out a little too far. Don't be surprised when you make a mistake. Don't be surprised when life happens and things don't go your way or a storm comes up because that's part of this deal and we need to be aware of it. Part of Peter's revelation after this near-death experience of the storm in Galilee is that we need to have a belief system that embraces suffering. Now this is a pretty big deal. Now we would call this our theology and our theology is everything we believe about God and of course is rooted in the Word of God in the Bible and it's inspired by the Holy Spirit and, and we also see it in our lives in our lives too as we work out our faith and, and as we have these experiences that confirm to our spirit that it's true and one of the big gaps that a lot of people have in life and even a lot of Christians have is they don't believe that suffering is intrinsically part of the Christian experience but all throughout the scriptures as, as we've talked about many times before from Jesus himself and even in the Old Testament and certainly in the New Testament letters as we saw today, suffering is a part of it. A- and so I think that for Peter, that, that was sort of beat into him on this day when he almost died and got to see it firsthand and, and actually ended up growing in his faith because of it. He kissed the wave that threw him against the rock of age as Jesus and he was a better person and he ended up with more fulfilling life and more joy and more purpose. First Peter 4.1 is before the passage that I read earlier, this is what Peter says. So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with that same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. He can't say it much clearer than that. Jesus is the example. Of course, Jesus is God the Son, second person of the Trinity, part of the Godhead. God suffered the most, even physically, And if he suffered, and he's our example, we need to be ready to suffer too. That's a theology that embraces suffering. It doesn't say you want to like suffering. (laughs) Again, it doesn't mean you have to desire suffering. You shouldn't pray for suffering. It's saying that you're going to get some, and when you do, allow it to push you into the arms of your Savior. Allow it to do the refining work that God wants it to do. doesn't mean God brought you the suffering, by the way. A lot of times it's just life. We're we're living in a broken world. We're broken people. And and we're still reeling from the effects of the sin and the fall uh, many, many, many years ago. But all of that leads to a life that is going to include suffering. And and on top of that, Jesus says Christians are probably going to suffer even more because of what we believe in and because of, of the lifestyle that we choose to live. So we should expect that. This, by the way, is probably the top most unpopular teaching of the Bible. And you can understand why. Uh, we don't want to embrace a theology of suffering. We want to embrace a theology that says it's always going to be beneficial to me. I'm always going to be blessed. Uh, there's a movie out right now uh, that is about Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. And I'm not picking on them or judging them, but you can, and I haven't seen the movie, but I, but I know that the problems that they saw were because of a wrong theology about suffering. They literally did not believe that suffering was part of the Christian experience, and they thought that God wanted them to be rich, God wanted them to be affluent, God wanted them to be blessed in every single way, and therefore he wanted all Christians to be. And if you were part of their ministry, that that was an understanding you had. And you can watch for yourself if you want to watch that movie, and I'm not recommending it per se, to see what that theology caused and all the havoc that it caused in their in their life in their lives Um, it it doesn't do what we think it should do instead we kiss the wave 
and we realize that our trials are going to be the very thing that shapes us to become more like Christ. And it doesn't have to be near-death experiences or huge cataclysmic events or trials that are just overwhelming to make us more like Christ. Everyday trials will do it too if we're faithful. And that doesn't mean perfect, it just means faithful. We get up every day and we keep going and we honor the Lord and we stay true to our beliefs and we're, we're true to our church family. We continue to be part of Christian community and we stay in the word and we stay in prayer imperfectly, but we do that. When you do that through even small trials, you get more mature, you grow in Christ, your relationship with him will be strong. Maybe you're in a season of life where you have little kids. My wife and I had four of them um, years ago. They're not little anymore. And I know full well what it's like to both love kids and have the blessing of children, which of course it is, but also the tyranny of the day to day and changing diapers and trying to get kids to school on time and trying to get their homework done. And there's a real trial in it. Make no mistake about it. If you're maybe you're a stay at home mom or maybe you're trying to work and do it too. Uh, or maybe your dad coming home trying to fill in the gaps and you're wiped out. Whatever it is, those are real trials and those can be your storm. doesn't have to be something that is cataclysmic. Maybe it's a, a job that you have that you hate and every day is a grind and you don't really feel like going into work. And it's everything you can do to just get there, but you want to put food on your table and you want to supply your needs. And so that's what you have to do. Well, look at it this way. That's your wave right now. And you can, you can kiss the wave that will lead you to the rock of ages. And it will. It doesn't mean you have to like it or even keep doing that job forever. But while you're doing it, you do the best you can. Uh, it could be a hundred small trials of life that just come all over the place. And how you handle them. See them as this amazing opportunity. That's what Peter is trying to teach us. That's our theology. That's what we believe. That th those are going to happen. They're going to be part of our everyday. So we need to build up this habit his everyday habit, kiss the wave in order to, to make it through. And then Peter goes one step further, and I read it in verse 13, 1 Peter 4, 13. He actually says, be very glad. Be very glad about these trials, these storms, these waves, whatever you want to call them. Be very glad. Now that one is a bit too much, isn't it? Like, come on, Lord. Like, I'm with you. I get it. You're, you're right. There's trials. They're going to happen. I got I to gotta anticipate them. I should be ready for them. I should even embrace them to some degree because I know they'll make me more like Christ. But be very glad. I don't know if I can be very glad. But that's what he says. That's the commandment here. This is the hard part. Now, when Peter and the disciples were crossing the Sea of Galilee, Jesus says, let's get in the boat and go to the other side. And when Jesus said that, I'm sure that he knew exactly what was going to happen. I'm sure that the mind of God knew that moments later, they're going to find themselves in a precarious situation. He knew that that storm was going to come. And guess what? He does in your life too. And when Jesus was patting down a little cushion or a pillow in the back of the boat and taking a nap and literally falling asleep, he knew that the storm was coming. He knew that the disciples were going to freak out. He knew that it would come close to them losing their lives, but he also knew that everything was going to be fine because, of course, he's not only a full man, he's also truly God. And that's exactly what happens and he's able to control that situation. Well, the same is true literally for you and me. God knows their trials are coming. He didn't necessarily cause them, like we talked about already, but he knows they're coming. He, he's not oblivious to them. He, he even is compassionate about it, but he also allows them to happen because he knows those are the very things we need. And that's why we can be very glad because God will see us through. God is present with us. He, he's in the boat with us. He, he's in our lives. He, he will not leave us or abandon us. He will actually grow closer to us in that moment than we've ever known him to be. And that's the sense of gladness. It's not a passing happiness or an emotional happiness. This is the word for true contentment. This is the word for true joy. That in my heart of hearts, yeah, I don't feel good about it. I, my emotions aren't great. But deep inside me, I can be glad. 
and that is possible. And this is probably the highest level you can achieve going through a trial. And really, this takes a lifetime to get to this point when you can actually say, in my heart of hearts, even though all of these things, and it doesn't mean, by the way, don't grieve for losses. It doesn't mean that you're not sad with emotions, of course, and you should grieve for losses. It's just saying that even when I'm grieving, I can deep down, I'm still glad because I know that my Savior loves me and he's with me right now. Uh, he will always help me. Andy and Ann uh, Flowers are just some of the most lovely people you'll ever meet. They're part of our church. Many of you know them. And I asked Andy if I could share just a little bit of what he's going through. Because about, I don't know, maybe a month ago, uh, his wife Ann uh, fell and she hit her head and did a very serious damage to her, her brain. And uh, Andy's one of these guys that's always at the church many hours of the week uh, as a volunteer, mowing the lawn, cleaning things up in the yard. Anne is practically a saint. Uh, she's doing things in our community all the time. She's always serving other people. She's always volunteering. And they've been examples to me of what it means to be a compelling presence for Christ, our vision statement. And they've really lived that out. So this, this has had all of us reeling. We're so sad, and, and yet we're hopeful and optimistic that Anne will be healed. She's been in and out of a coma. Andy, as you can imagine, has been beside himself with grief and just wondering what's going to happen. And he's had a lot of support from our church community. And I'm praying for a miracle, and I, and I believe that God is not done with Anne yet, but I don't know what, what God's will is. I, I pray that Anne fully comes out of the, the, the coma she's in and fully is healed and has full capacity so that she could be the Anne that we all know and love. Um, and Andy is learning, even in the stage of life that he's in, what does it mean to kiss the wave that throws us against the rock of ages. He's learning that probably in a way he's never learned before. He's going into that next gear, if you will, of his faith that I hope to achieve someday. Uh, not that we want the trials and we certainly don't want loved ones to be harmed or, or, or to lose them. But, but when those trials come, we lean on King Jesus and we allow the trials to make us the person he wants us to be. And we allow them to draw us closer and closer to God. And it's not just Andy's story. Like I said, there are many stories going on in our church, some that you wouldn't even know about, just people in a lot of pain. And I hope that that's really, really helpful to you as well. And this leads us to an important truth. Many people want God's benefits. In fact, probably most people, if not all people, even if they don't believe in God, they want God's benefits. Many Christians want God's benefits. But many people do not desire God himself. Now, this is a tough teaching, but I've observed it to be true. And I can even fall into this in my own heart if I'm not careful. We, we want to pray for the miracle. We want God to make our lives good. We want to prosper and, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's, we want to have a good health. There's nothing wrong with wanting that. Uh, we, wanna, we want all our family to be safe. I certainly pray that. We want all these blessings on our lives. We want to flourish. We want that for our church. And we want that for all of our family, loved ones, friends. And that's good. But that's all God's power. And that's all God's blessings. And that's all God's benefit. But do you really want God? And the only way to know is when you don't have all that other stuff. So what Job found out in the whole book of Job, you read it for yourself, he lost everything, including his family. And the question there is, is God going to be enough? And so when these trials come, it's a real test to see, am I clinging to the power of God and all the things that he can give me, like some cosmic Santa Claus? Or am I really clinging to God? Because if I love God and I love God, him through King Jesus, and I have a close relationship to him, then he will be enough in the time of trial to get me through anything because he's still there. I haven't lost him and I never will. And even if I lose everything else, God will be enough. And so that's something to think about. Let's get practical as we conclude, run down some, some steps. How do we make kiss the wave a habit in our daily life? Here are some thoughts. Uh, firstly, it changes your theology moves you from God wants me to be happy to God wants me to be holy. It makes me more like Christ, and that includes suffering. 
Also, it changes your prayer life. As I mentioned, I think most of us pray, and a lot of times it's urgent prayers, or it's prayers for safety, and it's prayers for blessing. That's good, but wouldn't it be great to have another 50% of our prayer life that is about my relationship with God, that I would close closer to Christ, that I become a better follower of Jesus, that I would have the Spirit of God in my heart, and so would my loved ones, that we would grow in grace. And you look at some of the New Testament prayers, by the way, and they're mostly that second kind of prayer, the deeper life prayer. It changes your perspective. As I, as I said, we can become eternal optimists. We don't become pessimists. We become vigilant, become aware, but that awareness of these trials actually makes us more optimistic because when they come, we're ready. And we know that this life is fleeting. It's passing by. It's short. And even our physical bodies are reminding us daily that there's a better life coming for us. We're going to get a new body. We're going to have eternal life in heaven. We're always optimistic about the future because the future is amazingly bright, unspeakably bright. It moves you from fear to faith. That's exactly what happened to the disciples when they were on the water. And Jesus said, where's your faith? Well, they didn't have much, but later in their lives, they do as a result of their trials. And it started that day on the water and it continued all the way when they saw their savior die on the cross, but also when he rose from the dead and their fears became faith. And that'll happen for you too, as you go through these trials. And then it makes us desire God, not just his blessings. Psalm 73, 25 says, whom have I in heaven, but you Lord, I desire you more than anything on earth. Let us speak with the psalmist the same way and desire not just God's blessings and benefits or get mad at God because my life isn't that great or not going the way I want. Say, no, no, it's okay because all I desire is God in the purest sense. What an aspiration. And then finally, it makes us more like Christ. That's what Peter's teaching us. That's our end goal. That's who God wants us to be. The people of God, a compelling presence, uh, we we become more and more the kind of people Jesus wants us to be all the way into eternity. So I hope that's for you. I hope that this is encouragement. I hope that you're hanging on, even if things are really tough. And, and I'd like to pray for all of us right now. Lord, I do want to pray for every person listening online with every need and every challenge and every trial that they're going through, that each one would look to you for help that you would meet their physical and daily needs. You would meet the challenges in their, whether it's marriage challenge or relational challenge or a job challenge, economic uh, loss, whatever it is. But I also pray that in the challenges, each of us would grow in our faith. We would become like Jesus Christ. We would draw closer to you, Lord, and desire you and you alone. And we do want to lift up Miss Flowers. We thank you for Anne and her life and We want to see her uh, for a few more years on this world, Lord. And so we pray you would heal her up. I do pray for the miracle that you lift her up out of this coma and help her to have full capacity. She would glorify your name again. You would comfort Andy and all of the other big needs that are in our church family as well. Nevertheless, your will be done. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you, church, for listening in. And I hope, again, that this is encouragement for you. Stay tuned each week for Win the Day. And check out social media because Natasha's been giving away some books I've heard. So you want to check out, especially Facebook, Instagram, maybe a good place to look uh, on the NCC page. You might win a book. And also, uh, Monday morning or throughout the week, check out the NCC podcast, NCC Beyond Sundays, wherever podcasts are found. I believe it's Spotify and Apple uh, Podcasts. And we usually do about a 15-minute um, extra about the sermon to, to help you in your everyday life. Have a great son. Have a great day.